Well, welcome to the Wilson Center. Uh, my name is Kent Hughes, and I'm just delighted to welcome you to our second major conference on the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Negotiations. I am pleased to say that we have had more RSVPs for this event than for any other event ever held inside the Wilson Center itself. So I think that's a credit to our panelists, to our CEO, and of course to Bob Zellick that you'll hear from very shortly. This is a product of seven programs here at the Wilson Center, Asia, Canada, Europe, Kissinger Institute, Latin America, Mexico, and my own program on America and the global economy. Uh, I want to let everyone know that we will be live tweeting at TPP Wilson. I uh, just feel that I'm moving into the new era here. <laughs> we will be taking written questions both from the audience here and from the overflow room so everyone can have a sense of participation. Well, it's now my distinct pleasure to introduce Congresswoman Jane Harmon, President, CEO of the Woodrow Wilson Center. Before coming to the center, the Congresswoman was elected to nine terms in the U.S. Congress, representing really the Aerospace Center of Southern California. During her years in Congress, she served on all the committees relation, related to national security, intelligence, armed services, homeland security. She continues that focus on national security by serving on key advisory boards for the Departments of Defense and State, the CIA, and the Director of National Intelligence. She built her experience on an outstanding academic record, magna cum laude, and Phi Beta Kappa at Smith, and a Harvard Law degree. Uh, most of the center, I have to tell you, no longer uses words like energetic or dynamo. We just say Jane Harmon, and they know what we mean. <laughs> <laughs> so, so welcome everyone and welcome to the uh, 21st century and tweets thank you Kent for that introduction I have to acknowledge the first uh, ambassador who ever tweeted so far as I know Arturo Sarakan who's sitting in the corner tweeting bilingually <laughs> bilingually trilingually there he is uh, he is the uh, immediate past uh, ambassador from Mexico to the United States, and he's a member of the Wilson family, as are all the rest of you. Is Hattie Babbitt here? I was going to acknowledge her. Yes, she is, speaking of the member, um, a member of the, and is that, is that Wendy? Uh, and Wendy Lures and Cindy. Well, half of the Wilson Center is here. Bob, you must be some kind of big shot, uh, is all I can say. And I love seeing a collaborative uh, uh, program here. That is the future of Wilson. We hope to have... Uh, more focus, more relevance, bigger programs with bigger shots, and it is a delight today to get to introduce um, a, a longtime friend and big shot, uh, Bob Zellick. Um, uh, I <laughs> uh, l let me say a few things first. As as Kent mentioned, I do serve on many advisory boards um, to the Defense Department, State Department, and our intelligence agencies, and I just spent a day and a half. Uh, as a member of the Defense Policy Board uh, at the Pentagon. Uh, the meeting ended a few hours ago, and we were talking about the rebalance to Asia and the fact that, uh, unfortunately, some misunderstand what it is and think it is a military rebalance. Well, it isn't a military rebalance. It is a whole-of-government rebalance. And when you think about whole-of-government, what do you think about? You think about trade and the economic relationship. And uh, many of us volunteered that this administration maybe hasn't done as good a job as it might articulating what the point of the rebalance is, and TPP is a centerpiece of that rebalance, and uh, that's why it's fitting that we discuss TPP today uh, at uh, the living memorial to our first internationalist president. Uh, we have been active in generating uh, actionable ideas for trade policymakers. And in December, Kent Hughes, who's the director of our program on America and the Global Economy, and William Christ, one of our public policy scholars, released a report on the TPP negotiations, which argued that the real potential benefit of the negotiations is that it can be a template for agreements with commercially important countries, including China and Russia and perhaps even for future, future multilateral trade negotiations. Uh, just last week, Stape Roy, who heads our uh, Kissinger Institute on U.S.-China, and I participated in the Aspen Institute's China Forum, 
And the message uh, we conveyed was that notwithstanding the negative chatter about our U.S. pivot, trade can be the centerpiece. And that's the thing I just mentioned again today. Uh, China would have to meet a high bar uh, set by the current participants, and some, of, some in China see the TPP as designed to contain China. But I don't know what Bob uh, Zellick's going to say, but it, it's certainly my view that TPP um, could, in the end, welcome China, and that could cement a relationship that we would like to have, which is a win-win relationship uh, with China. As Kent mentioned, I uh, spent a long time in Congress, uh, I did focus on uh, intelligence and security, uh, but uh, a strong economy is an essential part of our national security, and a strong economy in this country depends on strong trade relations, and I was very proud over the years, even though these were not very popular votes for Democrats in, in marginal districts like mine to make, uh, to vote for uh, first uh, most favored nation status with China, and then finally permanent uh, uh, national trading, uh, the PNTR, permanent national trading relationship, permanent normal trading relationship with China, uh, which finally put us on a better footing. So here to help us understand the international trade landscape is our friend Bob Zellick, who has held almost all positions in Washington, Deputy White House Chief of Staff, uh, USTR, Deputy Secretary of State, President of the World Bank. When it was announced that he was leaving the World Bank, uh, one of the first phone calls he got was from his friend Jane, who said, so Bob, what's next for Bob? How about coming to the Wilson Center? So as he points out, today he has come <laughs> to the Wilson Center. Please welcome a, a wonderful friend of ours, a really smart guy, and my occasional running buddy, Bob Zellick. Well, I very much appreciate uh, this invitation to participate uh, in this discussion on the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership at the Wilson Center. When I started to listen to the introductions, I was a little worried it might be the Comedy Central of the policy world here, but um, <laughs> I've always had an extremely high regard uh, for the Woodrow Wilson Center. My first contact came many years ago um, when I was working for Secretary uh, James Baker at I think it might have actually been all the way back at the Treasury Department. Is the Secretary of the Treasury on your board? I think is it because he was uh, he he was unable to attend, and I uh, sat in on a board meeting for or his uh, representation, and it gave me a first exposure to the types of discussion and people and ideas that go on here, which I think have only just accelerated over the years. So I've always been interested in having a sense of some of the policy scholars and the things they've written and produced, and also. Um, the ongoing publications of the Woodrow Wilson Center. And in that context, uh, I was absolutely delighted when uh, Jane came to the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, I always welcomed her friendship as well as her uh, guidance when she was in the Congress. And I am absolutely delighted that this gives her an opportunity to help continue to provide international leadership to her stewardship uh, of the Wilson Center. Um, and. Uh, as she mentioned, in terms of the trade agenda, having uh, learned that part of this is international policy and trade technical details, ultimately it's about getting votes for trade because under the Constitution, uh, that authority rests with the Congress. And Jane is exactly right. Uh, at least uh, more times than not, she was willing to try to give us a vote for free trade agreements and others while it was a tough issue uh, for her and others. So she was the person who walked the walk. Um, I've also had a chance to benefit uh, from the center's program on America and the global economy directed by uh, Kent Hughes. I think done some excellent work in this area. And I couldn't agree more about the definition of high energy as Jane Harms. And that's a, so as we strengthen our energy policy, we'll have to figure out how to get Jane in here too. Uh, and I had a chance to look at the pamphlet uh, prepared by uh, Bill Christ, which I think is a very fine overview of the TPP negotiations. Now, as, uh, as, as Jane mentioned and Kent mentioned, You've got some very excellent panel participants today, and I like the way you've tried to cover different types of uh, regional arrangements the United States has taken part in. So I just want to try to set the stage a bit. And to try to do that, I want to offer a perspective that will combine a bit of the strategic with a bit of the operational. And in doing so, I'd like to make five points. First, the strategic logic of the TPP is a natural evolution of the U.S. interests that prompted the United States government 
to press for the very creation of APEC way back in 1989. Even as the Cold War was drawing to a close, the Bush 41 administration was trying to put some structures in place for the future international system. And one of the most vital is to recognize that America's security alliances across the Pacific need an economic underpinning. Of course, the Asia Pacific is a region of dynamism and growth, and the United States has a very strong interest in integrating with that region, whether through trade, investment, supply and logistics chains, development of norms and rules ranging from customs to intellectual property rights, the expansion of trade in sectors such as services and capital markets and technologies, the environment, and a host of other topics. So in the strategic sense, APEC and now the TPP are a natural complement to another regional integration initiative launched by President Bush 41 as the Cold War was ending, and that's NAFTA, North American Integration. Yet when the United States negotiated NAFTA and helped initiate APEC, it simultaneously pursued global economic integration and development through the Uruguay Round that transformed the gap into the WTO. And this is a very key point. The United States is the largest and most innovative country in the global economy. So even as it pursues regional interests, such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership or the Transatlantic uh, uh, Trade and Investment Partnership, the TTIP, the United States needs to complement these negotiations with global steps that advance a healthier world economic system. Now, just last week, the International Chamber of Commerce and the U.S. Council for International Business released a very useful paper uh, prepared by my colleagues at the Peterson Institute, Gary Huffbauer and Jeff Schott, that offered some very practical ideas on WTO accomplishments, some of which could be closed by the time of the Bali Ministerial later this year. And some such achievements would rebuild momentum at the global trade level for liberalization, which is very much in America's interest. Second, the TPP has the potential, along with TTIP, to deepen U.S. economic ties with regions of great economic, political, and security importance to the United States. So from a geopolitical perspective, what Jane would work on all the time, TPP and TTIP could be America's economic bridges to the eastern and western borders of Eurasia, the landmass that dominates the world's population, economic potential, and security prospects. The U.S. share of the Asia-Pacific region's imports declined about 43 percent between 2000 and 2010. And U.S. exports to this high-growth region even lagged behind overall U.S. export growth over the course of that decade. So the need to try to strengthen the trans-Pacific ties is pretty apparent. The 12 countries negotiating the TPP represent almost 40 percent of world GDP, and these trading partners account for about 40 percent of U.S. exports of goods and services. Yet, the no negotiators are going to have to explain their logic for this particular negotiation, because the United States already has free trade agreements with six of the TPP countries. So a logical question is, what's the added value? Now, one is the accumulation of sourcing and more common up-to-date rules that offer some gains. The nature of the trade system has been changing very, very quickly over past years. And just consider the role of value and supply change through which the process of production spans numerous countries. The United States Chamber of Commerce has pointed to a study of apparel which is a sector that normally people in the United States sees as a defensive sector because of exports from developing countries. That revealed that 70 percent of the final retail price of apparel assembled in Asia is created and gained by American innovators, designers, or retailers. Therefore, the rules to facilitate trade, for example, through making customs and border procedures more efficient, will boost global and U.S. competitiveness as much or more than removing the traditional tariff and quota barriers. Yet, it's still not clear to me whether the aim of the TPP negotiating countries is an agreement that is more demanding than the current free trade agreements the United States has with six of the partners, or one that would exceed the WTO standards, but with provisions that might over time realistically draw in others in Asia. If the TPP seeks a higher standard than the existing free trade agreements, then what is the United States willing to offer in terms of lowering its barriers to achieve more from its current FTA partners? 
Third, Japan's participation in the TPP expands the scope hugely. Japan's involvement is a very big deal. Ten years ago, to be frank with you, I was skeptical that Japan would be capable of negotiating a comprehensive, high-quality free trade agreement with the United States. But the amazing work of USTR's Wendy Cutler and, frankly, the courage and decisiveness of Korea's former trade minister, Hyun Kim, shows what can be done. And if Korea could strike an FTA deal with the United States, Japan should be able to do so too. In another post-Cold War project of the Bush 41 administration, there was something called the Structural Impediments Initiative, the SII. And that's when the U.S. tried to get Japan to recognize that structural changes would be critical to Japan's long-term vitality. But the Japanese bureaucracy resisted back in 89, 90, 91, and they treated the exercise as one of negotiating concessions, not one of trying to drive fundamental reforms. Now, Prime Minister Abe and Finance Minister Aso now seem to recognize the critical need for Japan to make serious microeconomic reforms. And frankly, without those structural reforms, the very aggressive Japanese fiscal and monetary policies that you've been reading about are not likely to be sustained by real economic growth. And as we're already seeing in the markets and the newspapers, the initial beneficial boost to the economic psychology of Japan has to be backed by more fundamental changes in Japan's economic model. With structural reforms, including greater opportunities for Japanese women, who offer a tremendous untapped resource of education and ability, Japan could boost its growth and reshape the regional and global economic landscape. Anders Borg, a friend of mine who's been a very successful finance minister of Sweden, had his staff do some research on this gender issue. And he pointed out that if the participation of Japan's women in the workforce <coughs> matched Sweden's levels, Japan's GDP could be boosted by about 9%, and that's a pretty hefty increase. Japan's participation in the TPP is also a big plus for other countries. The United States could benefit much from Japan's liberalization of insurance, other service sectors, farm products, as well as investment reforms. And because Japan is such a big market, the other TPP countries could benefit a lot from more open trade with Japan, and that might make it uh, easier for them to be more flexible about some of the other cutting-edge trade reforms and rules. Fourth, the question that Jane asked, <coughs> where does China fit? Some in China view TPP as part of a U.S. effort to contain China, as Jane mentioned. I don't believe that is TPP's aim, and it wouldn't work in any event. China is much too deeply integrated in global and regional supply chains, and its growth is in fact fundamental to every one of the TPP partners. However, the TPP could be used as part of a competitive liberalization strategy to urge China to play a more active role in opening its markets, working with global rules, and enforcing those rules. Yet, and this is a key strategic point, if you're going to leverage the TPP as part of a competitive liberalization plan, the U.S. needs a complementary agenda with China. These initiatives could make clear that the economic strategy of the U.S. is not one of containment, but instead of offering opportunities if China also assumes responsibilities for the regional and global system of open markets. Now, one effort with China could be bilateral, <coughs> connecting trade liberalization with the structural reform plans that you read about in China. For example, through more competition and productivity in the services sector or complementary <coughs> interests in financial sector reforms, or the development and protection of technology and value-added products through IPR enforcement as China moves up the value-added chain. The two countries also share an interest in energy efficiency and water conservation. The U.S. could also both support and benefit from China's development of flexible, efficient safety nets, and we also share interest in open investment policies. Now, if the U.S. and China actually worked in concert to show global leadership through an active WTO agenda, for example, if the United States and China were leaders in the WTO service sector negotiations, or another one that's called the ITA2, the Information Technology Accord, that was so important in building the logistics and supply chains after the course of the late 90s, this could offer a chance for the United States and China to not only reform together, cooperate, but actually push a global agenda of reciprocal liberalization for the willing. 
finally, and most importantly, we have to focus our attention on getting the TPP done. Frankly, I'm much more concerned about the operational capability than the strategy. Rhetoric isn't the same thing as achieving results. The administration had an inert trade policy in its first term. The three FTAs that passed dated way back to the Bush 43 administration, and indeed two of them were almost completed during my tenure as USTR in President Bush's first term, and it took the Republicans in Congress to insist on the President's presentation of all three of these FTAs to Congress. So the key question is, will the President and his senior team have the political will to establish trade as a priority, make tough decisions, and critically, close the deals? Now I hope so. And all of us interested in trade and its larger place in foreign and economic policy should push the executive to match track, uh, talk with action. I'm very pleased the President nominated Mike Froman as U.S. Trade Representative. Mike is smart. He knows the issues. Very importantly, he has the trust of the President. After his confirmation, his challenge will be to build coalitions of support, drive decisions, <coughs> and push for closure. For example, the administration will need a TPA, a Trade Promotion Authority Strategy. The good news is Chairman Baucus in the Senate and Chairman Camp in the House have both already encouraged the administration to present a TPA approach. Frankly, those of us who are familiar with the hard edge realities of trade negotiations can identify the challenges ahead for the TPP in agriculture, services and investment, IPR, investor state dispute resolution, state owned enterprises, capital and foreign exchange issues, some manufacturing sectors and environment and labor. And the U.S. in particular will have to make some decisions about very difficult defensive issues, such as dairy and sugar, textiles and apparel, and footwear. And for those of you looking for another good summary of these and other topics, there's a very good short policy booklet that's been prepared by Jeff Schott, Barbara Kochwer, and Julia Moore of the Peterson Institute earlier this year. They actually did a very good quantitative assessment of the TPP and Asia-Pacific integration that was also uh, released last November. Now the good news is that I understand there's been considerable progress in outlining and even drafting the language of the 29 or so chapters that would comprise the TPP. <coughs> the not so good news is that there's been little progress on the market access negotiations and the key policy questions. And at least what I've been able to learn from the participants is the other TPP partners have been waiting for the U.S. to show its hand. Now, I suppose I have as good a sense of anybody about what actually goes into closing deals. One dimension is thinking creatively to come up with solutions that open markets while coping with political sensitivities. Sometimes there's a view that trade negotiations are like a poker game where you keep your cards close and somehow win the hand or the pot from somebody else. That just won't work because everyone has to be able to make a case for the deal back home. So the real task of trade negotiators is creative problem solving. But at some point, the principal negotiators who need to combine policy and technical knowledge with some political sense and an antenna for constituencies will have to make decisions. Now the stakes for the TPP are high, the potential benefits are very great, but the worst course is to talk about TPP without acting. So I hope that sessions like this one can build interest and support in Congress and with constituencies encourage the TPP partners and the United States to stretch for a deal, and most of all, push the administration to put its shoulder behind TPP to get it done. So thanks for the opportunity to be with you, and I'd be pleased to try to take some of your questions. <laughs> Floor is open. Did you have your hand up? Or are you just stretching? <laughs> okay. Yes, maybe it would be helpful if you give your name and who you're with. I'm Monica Campbell. I'm from the Washington Institute of Energy. Mm -hmm. I'm from the Washington Institute of Energy. I would like you to speak a bit more on the idea of um, accumulation of sourcing or accumulation of origin. How mm -hmm. important is that? How many of the countries that are no negotiating the agreement are well, on board with that? Well, um, the, the start of this is the point that I referenced about the changing nature of what's going on in the global economy. 
And the second reason I sort of stress this is there is a challenge with this TPP in that the United States already has free trade agreements with Singapore, Australia, Mexico, Canada. Um, what are the other, the other two that are part of it? Chile, Chile and Peru. And so as you ask, okay, well, what's the value added here with Malaysia, Brunei, Vietnam? Just as an old trade negotiator, I kind of learned the geography, the economic geography in, of each of those countries and some of the challenges. As I said, Japan changes that a lot. So one of the difficulties of, say, NAFTA is, is that that agreement's been around for a long time. And uh, it would be a political nightmare to try to reopen that agreement formally. But there are things we've learned. Uh, even in the time from NAFTA to when I was USTR 2001 to 2005 about how to try to improve or strengthen it. Now in the global sourcing area, <coughs> when we passed the Central American Free Trade Agreement, we actually tried to do some interconnection of sourcing, not only across Central America, but with some Mexican platforms in production. Now, as I've said, the world economy has changed enormously and the Information Technology Agreement was a good example of that in the late 90s, which now needs to be further updated. So. I was proposing that this is an area where you can uh, probably go sector by sector and even though you're using the current FTAs to try to see how you can integrate them more effectively. Now there's another aspect and that is you know, when the, the United States negotiated FTAs with various countries, um, you had in a sense the benefit of the bilateral relationship which also allowed you to kind of give answers to some of the protectionist interests because it was just for one country at another. But clearly you lose some of the economic benefits if that you would get in a more integrated system. That's why people would prefer a WTO trading system. So frankly this topic is also one that um, I think in the Western Hemisphere is worth looking at. The United States uh, through the various FTAs it has now has about I think 50% of the non-US GDP in the hemisphere because you've got Canada, Mexico, Central America, Chile, Peru, Colombia. Um, and uh, I think there'd actually be some potential to try to figure out how you might integrate those economies more effectively. And the nice thing about this from a larger strategic point of view is that you can also foster uh, sort of reformers in those countries that might even outpace your own. So. Uh, you mentioned since you're from Mexico, I think one of the most interesting things to happen in Latin America is this new arrangement, this Pacific group with Mexico, Chile, Peru, and Colombia that frankly represents a different economic view than Brazil and you're seeing what some of the problems of Brazil. So in terms of statistics, I think you'd have to go through each sector. I think in terms of policy, it's got some very important potential and it might allow you to bring something back in the agreement a little different than you would just by adding the other countries. Yes. She might want, did you want to, I don't know if they're making a record of it. Sometimes they like to have, <laughs> you get the mic. Thank you, uh, Jin and Chai Jing Magazine. Uh, I read your Financial Times uh, op-ed uh, about uh, great powers relationship hinges on the Pacific. And uh, you said Beijing needs to open a service sector to more competition. I'm just wondering why you single out uh, uh, service sector. Is this <coughs> a easier uh, op uh, operational uh, lay or is uh, just more urgent to get done? Thank Kay. you. Well, first, um, if you're interested in this, uh, that op-ed was partly drawn from a speech I gave recently in Shanghai which is now being published as an article in the National Interest. And to give you uh, the, the larger concept, I was trying to take this idea of a new type of great power relationship which President Xi Jinping had introduced and which Tom Donilon and now President Obama have embraced and tried to say this is a nice, this is an interesting concept. How might we fill it in in economics and security and others? And I think that's part of a what I hope will be a broader discussion that has now come out of the Sunnyland Summit. Particularly in the economic area, uh, when I was at the World Bank, we did a report with the DRC, the Development Reform Council in China, working also with other agencies to look at uh, the structural <coughs> reforms that China would need. The title of the report <coughs> is called China 2030. You may know about this. Liu Keqiang was very active with it as well. 
Um, one aspect of that is as, as China needs to move to greater uh, domestic demand, greater consumption, it will need to move away from the export-led growth and pure investment-led growth based on heavily on manufacturing exports. The service sector is a big, huge potential for increasing productivity, creating jobs, and adding innovation. And in my reference to Japan, this was actually the key sector we talked about with Japan in the SII talks and everything from retail store distribution and insurance and others, and Japan didn't move <coughs> on this issue. Now, my sense is, and you would know better and we'll find out by the third plenum of the party conference, that the, the area of services, things like logistics, financial services, transportation, health services, education services, this is one that you're going to see China open up more. Uh, Premier Wen Jiabao had already talked about this in the, with the prior group, talking about opening up to the private sector. Now, what I'm trying to marry together is to say, in diplomacy, it's often useful to try to identify the mutual interests, as opposed to just pounding somebody to get them to do what you want that they don't want. Well, this, but sometimes people don't see the mutual interests. Well, in this case, China is on a path for structural reform that would open up these sectors. And this is a natural for the United States and other countries to bring in their expertise, also help deal with some of the current account disputes and other sort of trade issues. So that's a win-win possibility. Now, the other part, though, that I put a little twist on this is that, uh, without getting too technical, the, the WTO has various negotiations going on, and one of them is a service sector uh, sort of negotiation. And for, for some technical reasons, it's set up so that the countries that participate in it will be the only ones that get the benefits, and that's unusual in the WTO system. Um, so uh, the United States and Europe and some of the other Latin American countries are part of the service sector negotiation. And I've urged that China, for its own interests, could support its own liberalization but also the global system. And I believe recently Chinese mm -hmm. entered those negotiations, which is an encouraging sign. Now, I'd like to go one step beyond, because I'm always looking for ways I can leverage policy issues in multiple ways. In addition to the structural reforms, in addition to dealing with some of the trade disputes, in addition to kind of helping overall economic growth, in addition to helping the WTO system, wouldn't it be interesting if the United States and China could play a leadership role in a global institution, showing how the leading developed and developing country could work together? So that's one reason I <laughs> emphasize the services. But as you'll see in my remarks, I didn't leave it at that. I mean, we could talk about energy efficiency, water, the, the te technology changes that China's going to need as it moves up the value chain. <coughs> the, to kind of close this out, one of the reasons I wrote that and put those out on both the Chinese and the U.S. side is that, frankly, this is what should be part of the SED dialogue that's going to go happen in the next few weeks, is that people should look for these points where each side is making structural reforms and how can they work together cooperatively and with a little creativity work on the international system. So it's an excellent example of how what some people might take as a technical trade issue of service sector can actually play at multiple levels. And it's why trade, to the contrary to all those political security types that you knew for years, didn't miss the big strategic or uh, aspects of economics and trade. Um, let me ask some questions yeah. from the overflow room. We want to be sure we include everyone. Uh, one is looking perhaps ahead to how this is going to eventually you know, kind of get through to Congress and mm -hmm. what specific opportunities might you highlight for U.S. manufacturers, exporters. There was one question that's come up a lot about how transparent these negotiations should be or can realistically be. Yeah. Another, I'm going to leave it at a third question, might this progress on the TPP front spur some parallel action at the WTO level? Yeah. Well, Let's take the first one. I touched on some of these in the remarks with both the offensive and the defensive interests. And, um, and it's one reason that I am urging a more ambitious agreement because as the, as the first question are really properly put on the table, you always have to think about how to pass these things, you know, how to get them through the Congress. And when you already have free trade agreements with a number of the countries, you have to ask yourself, what's the marginal benefit, you see? And the way, the way that I look at this at a micro as well as a macro level. I look at New Zealand and, you know, see New Zealand's got a very competitive dairy industry. The U.S. has a mixed dairy industry. Now, uh, as the New Zealand ambassador of the United States has pointed out to me, the United States actually has a very other export 
dairy industry that could be interested in opening up these markets, but uh, there's other parts, as you'll see in the Farm Bill, that are more defensive. And so uh, that's the New Zealand story. I mean, Vietnam is going to have inevitably questions about sort of freedom and politics and other aspects, and they're going to have to stretch to deal with some of these topics. So what I was trying to sketch would be if you expand some of these, uh, the, the sort of logistics and the supply chains, you do some new things in some of the areas that they'd like to try to do in trade facilitation, maybe intellectual property, I'm not sure what extra aspects they can get in there, that you can, you can and frankly the Japanese market has a whole new size, you can make a case that this could be important for the agricultural industry, that's very important with Japan, and that's a very big political base of support, but also some of the cutting edge technology industries, as well as some of the manufacturing industries in the United States that have adapted to the higher value added production. So I could see, properly put together, that it's, it's, uh, you know, it could cut across large sectors of the economy in, in addition to their strategic interests. However, the reason I put this, mentioned what I did, when I asked one administration official to say, okay, you want a higher level agreement than our current FDAs, what's the United States willing to give? And this individual said, well, I think Canada will open up its dairy industry. And I said, oh, I get it, you're trading other people's stuff. That's interesting. <laughs> so the, the other part of this is the United States is gonna have to open up some things too. Okay, it's just not a one-way deal. Now, the irony, the nice thing about being a trade negotiator is if you can manage the politics, when you, quote, give something away, you actually improve your economy. You make it more competitive, you open it up. Your, your second question was? Uh, there was a question about transparency. Yeah. That's appeared periodically. Yes, it has appeared. And I don't, I don't know a good enough answer to that. When I was U.S. Trade Representative, we put a lot of this stuff on our website. Now, what I've seen in some of the press is some of the negotiating material has been open to some of the negotiating groups and the, those advising them, which are big numbers, but not more generally. Frankly, that always surprised me because if you've got it open to 500 or 1,000 people, in my experience, it's pretty wide open. I, I'm actually kind of uh, at the World Bank and others a big believer in the transparency of those arrangements. So I don't know why they've been more restricted on some of those aspects. It might have to do with some of the other countries at this point. And then the third one was, could this be used to help the global system? That's the whole heart of my competitive liberalization approach. But my point is, as I, I drew out the special case of China, to do that, you can't just do the TPP and the TTIP. You also need a global strategy, or in this case, a bilateral strategy with China, so you interconnect those two. But that should, it, look, it, it's going to be hard enough to get the TTIP and the TPP done. But if we could, the United States should not be abandoning the global system in, in an effort to do this. However, we can't do it by ourselves. And so what, what held up the Doha round eventually was sort of a difference between some of the rising economic powers and the advanced economies. And so I believe that this offers an opportunity and services and other areas that will be important for middle-income countries to avoid the middle-income trap. But ultimately, they have to decide. And I always like the U.S. position to say, We'll work with you if you will, but if you won't, we're not going to stop. And that's the competitive strategy. Yes. Yeah, but I think maybe we can't take we have they'll, they'll get to it. There's one. Microphone's on its way. <coughs> Hi, Bob. I'm Laura Dawson. Um, I'm a trade policy consultant from Canada and a friend of the Wilson Center. And right now, the lead story in the Globe and Mail is uh, USTR liberalizing Canadian dairy industry. That was quite a, a newsflash. Um, <laughs> <laughs> my, my question to I you. I didn't tell you the person. <laughs> you, should, you should be opening that. I'm all in favor of cheaper cheese. <coughs> Free the cheese. I had a big fight, actually, with <laughs> one of your negotiators about trying to move the, your state-owned enterprises, and within a couple of years, your government unilaterally came to my position with the Canadian Wheat Board. Sooner or later, we always come around. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> my, my question has to do it's with... It's frightening <laughs> the detail you remember. In the <laughs> My question has to do with the level of ambition of the TPP actually being an impediment to the ability to close it. It is such an ambitious next gen generation deal. We hear so much from USTR about the different innovations that they're planning and wanting to right. put in there. Plus, we need to finish it by the end of 2013. Plus, we're open to maybe Philippines joining. It seems like this depth and this scope are maybe uh, going to get in the way of finishing it. What would you say to this, to, 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 to my assertion that it's uh, maybe in trouble that way? And could you speak a little bit more about the Pacific Alliance as maybe being a place to put that sort of ambition and U.S. prospects for joining the Pacific Alliance? 
Yeah, this is a critical issue, and I, I touched on it in my remarks, and let me be clear here. I, you know, I'm supportive of anything that opens up markets, and I'm certainly supportive of the United States resuming an active role in trade liberalization bilaterally, regionally, and globally. So I want to have the thrust of my comments be supportive. Having said that, you know, I've got scars from dealing with real deals, and so I kept trying to emphasize there's talk and there's action, okay? And what you identified, I also touched on by saying, when I've talked to some of the TPP partners, their view is this is higher than WTO, but not necessarily up to full-fledged USFTA, okay? When you talk to the US participants, they say this is higher than the FTA, okay? Well, my first question, as I posed, is, okay, if you want to make it higher, you're going to want to ask more from Canada, Australia, others. What are you willing to do, right? So it, you have to face that question. You have to face the politics of it, okay? Second, you can try to come up with, we did with things that are sort of integration, win-win, sort of modernization aspects, but you're exactly right. You have to figure out how much the traffic can bear. And frankly, there's been a lot of talk about deadlines and all this stuff like that. I mean, look, I know how this process works under the TPA with the types of notification <coughs> you have to give the committees and workers. There's no way you're gonna get this done in 2013. There's no way you're gonna get the TTIP done in the course of 2014. And I'm, while I'm big on stretch, I'm not big on false expectations, okay? You're gonna get disappointment. And here's an analogy. When I came into the USTR job in 2001, we had the free trade area of the Americas. It was a big thing, okay? It's a great concept. You could love it, la, da, 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 da. You know, but you're gonna, Argentina, Venezuela, I mean, you know, just, you know, and, and, and to leave out the question of Brazil. So you recall what we did was I basically followed on two tracks on the competitive liberalization. We kept doing FTAs with countries while we tried to do the bigger FTA. And my answer to your question was a little bit, I'd look to try to integrate the core that you have and maybe in another generation of policymakers in Brazil, mm -hmm. they may wanna, because it's a different attitude from the, some of the governors I see than the current group. They may wanna change on some of these things. So the bottom line is I don't know exactly where you know, one, one should couch the ambition. You need to couch it enough so that you can show that you've got some practical things done and it sort of makes a difference. And it, on, and it clearly also depends on your view of is the TPP designed primarily to set a new high global standard or is it designed in part to be good enough, better than the WTO that you're gonna bring in others in the system? The politics, I'm just telling you, the politics in the US tend to push you towards more ambitious agreements because everybody's always afraid that if they don't get it in this one, they'll never get it, okay? Now, the European system's a little different. The European system has actually kind of reviews of the trade agreement. And one of the things that people are gonna need to think about for the TTIP as well as the TPP is whether you kind of adjust your model a little bit. So that, that's just the briefest allusion to what I was talking about with creativity is that <laughs> As one of my non-American friends said, sometimes American negotiators are very good at raising the bar for others, okay? <laughs> but, but at the end of the deal, you have to do a deal, okay? And so I, I can't emphasize this <coughs> enough because and I came with some credibility. I closed a lot of deals of different things, German unification, trade, and others. And I'm not a soft touch, but on the other hand, you, you can't just talk. So there's a set of issues that all relate to your question and they will be absolutely vital. Let me ask two last questions from our overflow room. In your comments, you talked about between TTIP and TPP, we were really, in a way, bracketing broad Eurasia. But a major country that's not part of either group is Turkey. <coughs> Love to get your thoughts about how we well, might engage I thought they were going to say India, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> and the second question, someone asked us just maybe just a word or two about dispute settlement in the investment chapter. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> well, on the first one, um, in general, you know, the thrust of my remarks that the United States needs to be global as well as regional is that many of the countries, India, Turkey, others are sort of middle income countries that are going to, that are facing this question. There's a debate among scholars about this of the so-called middle income trap. And just to give you a reference point, the World Bank went and looked at the there are 101 economies that it classified as middle income in <coughs> 1960. 
By 2008, it's almost 50 years later, only 13 had made it to high income, and one was Greece. So you figure out whether it's 12 or 13. <laughs> um, this has not escaped the developing market countries, and this goes back to your service sector and other. The, there are issues about how to maintain productivity and growth. For some countries, it's infrastructure, other aspects. So what I would be doing in the U.S. is, A, trying to find the aspects that you can either do some of that bilaterally, frankly, do some of it with work with the development institutions, with public-private partnerships for infrastructure and others, for the Turkeys, for the Indias, but also try to figure out how um, you might be able to advance some of these in some of these global negotiations. So you need an agenda, and, and, keep com and what I keep coming back to is you know, bilateral, regional, global, and kind of work the, the system overall. Um, now, the second issue you had was the dispute, the dispute investor. Settlement in the investment yeah. chapter. Very controversial topic. It's a good example of when we were talking a little bit about instead of NAFTA. This was one of the key innovations in the NAFTA. And when I became USGR in 2001, you know, one of the things I learned is uh, lawyers are creative as well as persistent. And so there had been a, there was, there was a whole bar that was created to work these investor dispute systems. And I say this as someone while trying to support openness and investment liberalization, there were some e interesting political constitutional issues here because you started, they're, they're supposed to be determined in very narrow terms, but instead, uh, you know, lawyers would try to press for new findings. And if you think about it, you just created a semi-judicial system outside Article Three courts, outside the international, so it's a tricky thing. So what we did is, and it took a big, big battle, is, is that I spent a lot of time discussing this with various groups of concern, not pleasing all of them, but we came up with a series of limitations that some of the bar didn't like, but it was important to maintain the political support for these issues. Now, part of this was, as is often the case, some of the cases, you know, had they, they actually weren't going to come down against the environmental body, but people get scared, and then they get scared how they could be used against them or being leveraged. So uh, I'm not as current uh, about exactly the state of the disputes in that sector, but it's one of the reasons I highlighted investor <laughs> dispute settlement issues because, again, my basic point would be I would probably try to do what I did in 2001, go back and learn from the experience, and politically, you got to run a balance. You got to try to help from the investor side to make sure there's the rule of law in these systems. But if you let the legal bar push it too far, you're going to get a lot of negative political blowback. And this comes back to this question. Look, I kind of like this aspect of a job, but it's it's it, it's difficult. At the end of the day, you got to get the votes. Okay, I can talk endlessly about strategy of this or that. You got to get the votes, and that means you got to bring along the constituencies. You got to help other guys on the other side be able to deal with their political problems so they can get the vote. The, what very few Americans recognize, the USGR is actually a very <laughs> intriguing job because in some ways it's domestic politics to the bottom line. I, you know, I still know constituency by constituency where it is in the different states and so on and so forth. On the other hand, internationally, for many countries, international trade is an important part of their foreign policy or is their foreign policy. So we as a country, and it's one reason why this discussion and the type of research here is very good, you need to operate it at different levels. And that's why Mike Froman's got, Mike Froman's got a challenging job ahead of him, but he's a very capable person. Well, thank you very much. This has been just absolutely terrific. Please join me in a round of applause. really need to put you in charge of something, something important. <laughs> <laughs> Can I invite the uh, first panel to join me here, as well as moderator Bill Christ? I'm going a, to introduce the, the, the and, moderator, and, I'm a, I'm a and then he's going to inter introduce our distinguished Way panel. Your time. Bill Chris, the distinguished gentleman with hair that's almost as gray as my own, is a senior scholar here at the Wilson oh, well, Center. I'll take some he uh, spent his time here very well. He is about to publish a book, Globalization and America's Trade Agreements, in this coming out this August. He has done a number of other publications while he's here. A number of you picked up a paper that he did on TP on the basis of our, our last conference here. He has a wealth of background in the trade arena. 
He's uh, several years at USTR. He was the senior vice president of the American Economic Association, American Electronic Association. You know, I didn't mean to push him into the economics world, which has now become one of the most reviled professions in Washington, as you know. My own, I would say. He uh, has uh, spent time on the Hill. He was very distinguished both uh, in the House and the Senate. He worked for many years at Commerce, also on trade policy, and really brings a wealth of experience and a depth of understanding. Bill, let me turn the program over to you to introduce this very distinguished panel. Okay, and I can never live up to that. I still love, but <laughs> thank you very much. Is my mic working all right? Yep. yep okay, good. Well, um, yeah, welcome to all of you. And I have to say I'm delighted to be able to be part of this panel. Um, we've got three very good speakers here, and I think they have a, a great deal to say. Uh, before I get them started, let me just take a quick one second, uh, make a comment on context of all of these uh, regional negotiations. I think all of you know that um, when the post-World War II trade architecture was set up, the fundamental concept was most favored nation treatment, and um, under which all benefits would be extended to all other members of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. The reason was the uh, framers of that architecture thought that the preferential agreements between after World War I contributed to a lot of political frictions, and they thought it caused a lot of trade diversion. So that was the original concept. Flash forward to today, and um, there have been some uh, 546 notifications to the World Trade Organization four regional trade agreements, and 354 of those are in force. So what you really have is um, most favored nation trade may be an exception and regional agreements the rule. That's uh, an exaggeration, but, but not by a huge amount. And I think with the, uh, the uh, sluggishness in the Doha development round, you're going to see even more um, movement and emphasis on uh, regional trade agreements and, and negotiating them. And of course, the U.S., our two big ones are the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Transatlantic uh, Trade and Investment Partnership. So we've got a lot going on, but I think that um, the real hotbed of negotiations is in Asia, um, where there's a ton of things going on. And um, you're going to hear all about these in a lot more detail from our panel. So let me get introducing each of them. Um, each will talk for about 10 minutes. And um, I, what I'd like to do is introduce all three of them and then have them speak and have you hold your questions until they're done. So uh, that'll give us at least half of our time for questions and discussion. And um, you all have their bios in your packet. So I'm going to be, be uh, very high level, uh, very brief in my introductions of each of them. Um, and also, I'd like to apologize in advance real quickly. If I cut anybody off at all here, I'm going to ruthlessly try to keep us on schedule. Uh, Kent's going to shoot me at 4 o'clock. So I'll do my best. On <laughs> <laughs> so um, our first speaker is uh, Ari Van Ash, who is a professor of international business at HEC Montreal. He has a master's in Chinese studies and a PhD in economics. So a uh, perfect background for this. And he's been very uh, interested in a leading thinker in uh, industrial organization and how that relates to trade. Our second um, speaker is Michael Geary, who is uh, another fellow here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. And he's working on a book on integration or disintegration, why the European Union needs a post-enlargement policy. So very much related to this. And he's also an assistant professor at the Maastricht University in the Netherlands and a PhD from a, a European University in Florence, Italy. And our third speaker, Roberto Herrera Lim, is director in the Asia practice at the Eurasia Group. And he focuses on Southeast Asia's uh, policies, including economic policies and development policies. And so he'll be discussing how ASEAN and TPP and all of this fits together. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, and then we'll go through it, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, thank you very much, Bill, for the, uh, the introduction. Thanks, Ken, for 
uh, inviting me to come over here. Um, so as Bill already indicated, um, uh, one thing that's been occurring the last couple of years is uh, a, a, an almost exponential rise of uh, new free trade agreements that have been occurring, um, including now some, some really big ones that are in negotiation, being the TPP, um, uh, CETA, uh, TTIP, uh, uh, et cetera. So what I want to do is uh, I, um, I want to kind of um, uh, step back a little bit and try to um, look at why we suddenly see this rise of uh, free trade agreements. And so I'll make the argumentation that uh, the reason is that we're living in a new trade reality th that is different from two decades ago, and that this has actually led to this um, uh, uh, new trade policy that is coming uh, with us. Um, so to make this point, um, uh, I'll, I'll be kind of uh, looking at uh, global value chains uh, as a part of that. So to, to kind of make this point, it's, it's interesting to step back and uh, look at uh, how we were used to thinking about uh, trade and trade policy uh, in the past. And you see, still see this if you open textbooks about international trade uh, all the time. So, so the way that we've been thinking about trade is that you've got a world with a lot of countries, and in, in these countries you've got firms, and these firms all make their um, products locally and try to trade them internationally. So there is kind of this background assumption of um, that uh, w we have local value chains uh, where products that are being exported by China are made in China, products that are being exported by Canada are made in Canada, uh, etc. Okay? So um, if you kind of think about uh, the world working this way, then the only reason why companies would want to trade internationally <coughs> is in order to sell their products into other markets. So you automatically get then that trade is an issue of getting market, market access into other countries. And so if that is the case then, then automatically if firms are <coughs> lobbying for trade policy, what they will be asking for is two things. One is uh, export promotion in order to be able to sell in more markets. And at the same time, some firms will be lobbying for import protection because whatever is coming into your country is foreign competition. Okay? So this is kind of the mercantilist trade policy. What the World Trade Organization has very successfully done is uh, bring different um, players to the table and negotiate market access between uh, different countries. The problem is that this reality here is, uh, or, or this, this depiction of trade is no longer uh, the reality. Uh, because uh, if you kind of look at how trade is working right now, you've got Topper the Trick Terrier here, which is for me kind of a nice depiction of what is going on. So Topper the Trick Terrier is a very simple toy that can jump and bark. Um, um, but at the same time, it has actually a quite complex uh, value chain where you have uh, many different companies from many different countries involved in the production process and components being made in at least eight uh, different countries as well. This, of course, here is a simple depiction of a global value chain, but there's a lot of aggregate indicators that global value chains are on the rise and are very important. Currently, more than 50% of uh, non-oil trade is trade in intermediate goods. Um, if you look at Canadian exports, but you can also look at other countries, what you'll we'll, we'll find out is that more than 30% of their value of exports is actually the value of imported components coming from elsewhere. So value chains are very important. Um, so the new trade reality is that um, value chains are global or more regional, uh, but they're, they're not necessarily local anymore. Now, immediately when you kind of start thinking about the existence of, of global value chains, the reason for companies to trade internationally starts changing as well. Companies are not just trading internationally to gain access into other markets, sell their products in new markets. A lot of companies, when they are trading internationally, they're doing this in order to gain access to cheaper components or higher quality components. Uh, but they're really doing this in order to uh, strengthen their competitiveness um, um, uh, by um, getting access to uh, uh, imported uh, intermediate goods. This, of course, is related to uh, offshoring, international outsourcing, et cetera. Um, the other thing that kind of comes with it is that when companies are, are thinking about this, they are no longer just thinking about international trade. They are increasingly thinking about investment because they don't just want to buy components from other countries. They want to be able to make their products cheaper in other countries as well. So investment and trade starts kind of uh, becoming more uh, interrelated. Okay, so there's a whole lot of studies that are demonstrating that indeed uh, companies 
uh, international competitiveness is, is heavily impacted by their ability to source imported inputs, um, uh, inputs from abroad. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm listing a couple of, of them here. But if you kind of think about this, that, that companies um, uh, indeed realize that their competitiveness um, is not only important on how they can sell on the export side, but also on how they can uh, import products as well, you suddenly see them demanding different types of trade policy. Um, the first thing that they might be asking for is, instead of saying import protection is, uh, is, is what we want to have, they might actually be asking for uh, tariff reductions on imported intermediates. Uh, the Canadian government has uh, recognized this uh, recently, and they have unilaterally decided to get rid of a whole lot of um, uh, tariffs on uh, imported intermediate goods, exactly for this reason. The other thing that companies are starting to, to really lobby for is um, not only trade liberalization, but also investment liberalization uh, with this as well, because yes, it can get you into more markets, but also you can actually source your products um, uh, more cheaply. Another thing that they start then, then suddenly uh, paying a lot of attention for is if you've got a supply chain that is, um, is uh, crossing many different borders, then you want to be able to um, uh, have it work as efficient as possible. So to do that, you want to have beyond the border uh, trade facilitation and regulation harmonization uh, going on uh, as well. So these are all new things that suddenly in a global value chains world become more important. Of course, one thing that, that is, uh, is, a, is a touchy issue is that if you can offshore um, things and you can arbitrage cost differences between countries, then there is a fear that maybe this will lead to a race to the bottom where companies will, uh, that are uh, heavily pollutive will be moving their production to countries with low pollution standards. So uh, because these are issues that um, people are also um, uh, concerned of, uh, there's also an increased demand for labor and environmental standards. Now, the problem is that there is a new trade policy demand going on, but the existing infrastructure that we've been working with, uh, so especially the World Trade Organization, um, uh, has not really um, been set up in order to deal with this in a good way. So the WTO has been focusing on shallow integration uh, at the border measures um, through the principles of most favored nation and non-discrimination, um, but beyond the border measures, um, even uh, um, um, uh, investment liberalization have not really been their domain. And so what governments have been doing is they have been looking for loopholes. And ultimately the biggest loophole in the WTO system is free trade agreements. So what you've been having is a rise of second generation trade agreements with deep integration among countries that are willing to have these kind of ne negotiations. And so you can certainly see TPP and CETA and, and all these as kind of a part of this. This really is related to uh, global value chains. There's a couple of uh, high profile studies that have come out to, uh, to do this that actually demonstrate that countries that are highly integrated through global value chains are more likely to form um, preferential trade agreements with deep integration. So there is uh, some evidence of this. So if you then kind of look at um, CETA, uh, so this is uh, transatlantic and the TPP, which is a um, uh, Trans-Pacific, uh, you really find out that these are um, second generation trade agreements that are moving beyond traditional areas of negotiation toward new areas. So what are they? Uh, these are very different uh, trade agreements because um, um, Canada EU is between two, two uh, areas, TPP is between many different areas, Canada EU is only between these two, TPP can be open, et cetera. But it's actually remarkable to see that ultimately they are discussing the, the same areas of um, policy. So they are talking about market access for goods, agriculture, and services, which are kind of the traditional domains, but you have a whole lot of new domains, creative domains that are coming in there as well. This includes FDI liberalization, IPR protection, competition policy, so all issues that traditionally have not been really in these uh, 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 negotiations. Uh, you also get, of course, uh, um, uh, issues that are very much important for global value chains, which is trade and investment facilitation, regulatory uh, harmonization, uh, uh, et cetera. And you also have these environmental um, and labor standards. So you do find out here that there is much, much more going on. Um, as Robert Zulik uh, indicated before, this gives opportunities because if you're negotiating more things, you can actually perhaps find new areas where you can trade um, um, uh, benefits and, and, and costs. But I, I just want to kind of argue that there are also a couple of stumbling blocks that kind of come with this that certainly are going to become more important in the, um, uh, in the, the, uh, the years to come. 
So um, one stumbling block that, that is going to be very interesting is, is the territoriality. So uh, second generation trade agreements are moving beyond the traditional uh, areas of negotiation uh, and this can actually create some kind of a jurisdictional conflict. So one is uh, trade negotiators versus other governmental departments. So you can have um, in, in Canada, DFET and Industry Canada and Transport Canada having very nicely delined kind of areas where they should be focusing on. Well, ultimately here, um, uh, they all have to get, get together and they have to be able to negotiate uh, these things together. This is more kind of a coordination issue. This probably is actually a good thing that they talk to each other more, uh, but nonetheless, it's, a, it's an issue that can kind of create bureaucratic uh, hurdles over here. Another one is that is actually um, uh, interesting as well is that the moment that you go toward beyond the border um, uh, areas of, of negotiation, you do kind of get issues um, where um, maybe uh, the federal government is doing the negotiations, but they are kind of infringing on areas where provincial or state governments actually have um, uh, a lot to say on. Um, and so this is an, an issue that certainly also um, is uh, a new area of complexity that uh, the second generation free trade agreements uh, um, can create. Uh, if you kind of um, look at Quebec and Canada, uh, this can kind of be in an, an area where this can, can create a, a significant uh, uh, troubles. Um, another stumbling block is fragmentation of traditional interests. So I was actually a couple of weeks ago in, in Ottawa uh, at a conference that was looking at uh, similar issues. And so uh, a couple of people mentioned that the business community doesn't seem to be as much behind the free trade agreements like CETA and TPP as they were for NAFTA. Um, and so they were kind of questioning why this might be the case. So one reason why this might be the case is because as the trade reality is changing, the interests and the align alignment of interests might be changing as well. Um, and I'll give you kind of one example here uh, that demonstrates this. So, so this is an, 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 uh, an issue that occurred uh, in the United States at a certain moment. Um, the US was thinking of putting a, I think it was an anti-dumping measure against shoes from Vietnam. Um, and so you had people that were for and against, but one, one thing that was interesting was that you actually had two different US companies that had completely different points of views about the same issue. You had New Balance, which has a more local value chain that was arguing for uh, the duties because this would uh, ultimately um, uh, increase their competitiveness. And you had Nike, who ultimately, that is an American company, but that is sourcing a lot of their shoes uh, from the Asian region that was actually uh, arguing uh, for uh, the redu reduction of, uh, against the uh, anti-dumping measure because they felt that it would be reducing their competitiveness. This is a new reality in a global value chains world where it's not all the firms that have global value chains and therefore the, the alignment within industries actually um, becomes kind of uh, uh, broken. Now, this issue here then brings a new interesting issue that certainly is going to get a lot of attention in, um, in, in coming years, and that is if you have firms that are integrated into global value chains and have production in many different countries, et cetera, et cetera, what is then um, that company? Is it an American company? Is it a Canadian company? How should you, should you deline it? Um, and this reminds me of a paper, uh, a very, very nice paper that Robert Reich uh, wrote um, in the early 1990s uh, where he asked the question, uh, who is us? And I think that in the era of, of global value chains, uh, this is an, uh, a question that everybody should be asking uh, who is interested in, um, in trade policy. So I'll, I'll kind of leave it here. Great. Thank you very much, Ari. Appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, now let me turn it over to Michael. And so um, yeah. Let me take the controls. OK. Okay, uh, thanks Bill, and uh, let me thank also thank uh, Kent Hughes for organizing this event. Uh, it couldn't have come at a more timely moment. Um, uh, I'm going to talk today about the what I refer to as the, the American pivot back to Europe, away from Asia. Uh, so I, I'm glad uh, Jane has left. Uh, because we have two feet. So. <laughs> exactly. Well, yes, well, <laughs> our white arms. Um, and also, uh, I suppose, uh, as Bob Zellick said a while ago, uh, 
the TPP is a big deal. Uh, I would argue that the TTIP is a bigger deal, um, and this is what I will focus on uh, in my short presentation. Um, in, and try and wrap it up, wrap up how TTIP fits into not only TPP, but also uh, to the wider, I suppose, global trade issues and the uh, Obama administration's uh, master plan for, for global um, uh, trade renegotiation. Um, I suppose as most of you know, last Friday, the European Union uh, EU trade ministers uh, delivered their official mandate to the European Commission um, to begin negotiations on an agreement. And then on Monday in Northern Ireland at the G8 summit, um, the US and the EU finally agreed that they would uh, begin negotiations formally and they would open TTIP negotiations next month uh, here in, in DC. Um, TTIP is a big deal. Uh, it is a big deal for a number of reasons, not only because it, create, it will create the biggest and perhaps the most complex trade deal in history, but it, al it will also provide a major boost to the European Union at a time when um, unemployment in the European Union has reached about 12%. Uh, unemployment in countries like Spain is about 26%, 14% in Ireland, and et cetera, et cetera. So TTIP, uh, in many ways, uh, is the only show in town for Europeans at the moment. And this is, this is something that uh, the European Commission member states are putting a huge amount of uh, time and effort into, into, get into getting this uh, off the ground. Um, TTIP, as I said, is the biggest trade deal uh, or will be the biggest trade deal in history, depending on how it's negotiated. And in the presentation, I want to present two types of scenarios, um, not totally dissimilar to what uh, the, Bertl the Bertelsmann Foundation published on Monday. They published a quite a comprehensive overview of two uh, competing types of agreements that the Europeans and the Americans could negotiate, one where it's just simply reduction of tariffs, and the second which is a far more com comprehensive liberalization. Um, and they came up with some very, very interesting results in terms of the winners and losers, uh, although uh, the EU and US try and sell this as a win-win, but certainly it looks as if, uh, at least on, the, on the, the most current statistics, that the Americans come out on top of any uh, negotiated TTIP arrangement. So from Alaska to Athens, this is certainly one of the biggest trade deals that will ever be negotiated. It's far bigger than NAFTA. Uh, it allows the Americans access to a uh, 16 trillion euro uh, uh, European economy. It's a major access for the Europeans, provided this gets off the ground. Um, it will create uh, half the world's uh, output, uh, economic output will be included in this negotiated agreement. Uh, and the, the main goal here is to create, although there are many goals, but certainly one of the overall overarching uh, goals is to create a single set of standards for the marketplace. And as Bob mentioned a while ago in his comments, uh, there's been an awful lot of talk about controlling China and you know, setting standards for China. I think when you look close and closer to the TTIP and also to TPP, you do see that, yes, that is there. It's in the background. It's an important element in setting standards and harmonization of regulations. But on, on a very I suppose, primitive and very uh, basic level, this is really about boosting trade between these two trading partners. And this is certainly to the fore of the TTIP negotiations. Um, Barack Obama said today in Berlin that we have a profound stake in each other's success. We agree that there is more work to do. Not only do we need to grow, we also need to reform our economies structurally. And what really has struck me um, uh, over the last number of months, particularly here in DC, is the, is the huge interest the Obama administration has put into uh, getting the TTIP off the ground, um, based on the work of the uh, high-level working group over the last year in Europe. I uh, will get to that in a moment, but certainly uh, President Obama <coughs> is making all the right sounds uh, in terms of getting this agreement um, finalized uh, as soon as possible. Uh, EU-US trade, and I, I'm not here to, uh, as, a, as a poster boy for, uh, as for this agreement, for a, a, a positive or negative outcome, but certainly um, what does surprise you here in the United States is the, the, the lack of attention that the media seems to give to this trade deal, or to trade deals in general. I mean, it's, it doesn't, uh, after the G8 summit and after the announcement that these negotiations would open in DC next month. New York Times and Washington Post gave very little um, front coverage to these to these de to this this really uh, history making agreement or history making decision potentially. Um, the existing relationship between the European Union and, and the EU the, the, the numbers are, are are there for everyone to see. Uh, goods and services are worth 2.7 billion dollars um, traded and are bilaterally between both sides. United States. Uh, and the US have, have invested trillions in each other's economies. 
And what's interesting, this new trade deal is, uh, I suppose there's, there's these, the, there have been a number of different uh, figures bandied about in terms of you know, the benefits and the, and the cost benefits to each, each side. Uh, the European Commission's figures show that there would be an additional 0.5% uh, added to EU GDP and 2 million jobs would be created. Now, a million of those jobs will be created in the, in the United States uh, if there is a comprehensive trade deal uh, agreed. And Bertelsmann Foundation, in their assessment on Monday, came to the same conclusion that we are looking at about a, a million jobs created uh, in the United States. Um, the Commission says it's about a, a, a 119 billion uh, benefit to the European economy, 95 billion to the US economy. Again, a uh, report this week said it actually would be the other way around, that the Americans would benefit more uh, annually than the Europeans. Significantly, uh, and this is something that David Cameron has been pushing uh, over the last number of days in, in Northern Ireland, is the potential benefit to the British economy. And what I, th I think you know, one of the underlying issues from TTIP is actually the, the importance that TTIP may well play, the role it, it may well play in keeping Britain in the European Union, uh, given the, the massive uh, benefit that, that he has, uh, he's argued uh, that will result, a 10% boost to economic output um, um, per head and 400,000 jobs in the long term. That's a significant. Uh, you can already see the, the, the election posters or the referendum posters in 2017, you know, 400,000 jobs uh, attached to TTIP. <coughs> so Cameron is, is seriously pushing this agreement. And again, the political will is there to get this, uh, at least on his side, um, to, to quell the backbench revolt and uh, to... Uh, to, to maintain the high ground on, on, main, on staying in the European Union. So this is, uh, on, on national level, this is also cru quite crucial. Um, the EU-US relationship then, again, when, when in, a, in a city where Europe is not the most popular place, I think uh, uh, the, political, the, the, the policy wonks in, in Washington and in the United States in general tend to forget that uh, EU or American investment in Europe um, is more than most of their uh, than investment that America has anywhere else in the world combined. Um, and that's is, is crucially significant. I mean, the, the amount of British investment in, in, the, in the United States is bigger than their, their investment in any other part of the world. Um, so there is, you know, uh, the, the relationship, which more often than not is simply discussed on political levels, on an economic level, this is a, a very, very crucial um, uh, uh, piece of the uh, global trade network. And TTIP becomes you know, increasingly important as you go below the surface and look at some of these uh, phenomenal um, results or some phenomenal statistics. Now, TTIP, um, there's been lots of talk about um, trying to come to uh, an agreement on various issues. It becomes exceptionally political as TPP is political. I suppose one of the benefits of, or one of the positives with TTIP is that the European Commission has a mandate. The European Commission has received a mandate from the Council of Ministers, and they will now negotiate with the European, with the, with the United States. Another positive is that when, if they find an agreement, um, the European Parliament has to say yes or no. So the European Parliament can't amend um, the final draft, the final agreement. Of course, things are different here in the United States, but uh, on, the, on, on our side of the Atlantic, things will, should go a little bit smoother, although there is precedent for the European Parliament to say no. Now, negotiating uh, TTIP, of course, is not going to be easy. and everyone, everyone has mentioned the complexities and the challenges. Uh, I will uh, deal with some of those in a moment. I think some of them are a little bit exaggerated. They're simply just the same lines are rehashed over and over again. Um, but there, I think we, we, there's more that we agree on than we disagree on. This is why I think where I disagree with Bob Zellick is that uh, we may well reach the finish line quite close to the end of 2014. Now, on the issue of what are they going to agree and how, they how will they um, negotiate uh, this deal, <coughs> there's two scenarios that, that, really have been, that we've been focusing on. One is deep trade um, uh, liberalization, which is exceptionally complex. Um, the reduction of non-tariff barriers, the NBTs. Um, this is complex, and there's no getting away from that. We're talking about standard recognition. We're looking at uh, liberalization, liberalizing services, procurement. These are all major uh, areas of disagreement. Um, the least difficult area, perhaps, is on the reducing tariffs. Um, average tariff rate is about 3.5% between the European Union and the United States. 
that should be reduced to zero and that will you know add certain amount if, if it's only on tariffs there'll be a negligible um, impact on US EU trade um, again if it's if the European Union and the US only agree on a tariff reduction which is highly unlikely and the deal won't be worth the paper it's written on um, again the Americans benefit from this deal uh, on a three percent three and a half percent tariff reduction bring it down to zero uh, the Europe the Americans come out on top again um, in terms of trade and investment also importantly given Britain's trading relationship with America at the moment they also benefit significantly from even just a small three and a half percent tariff reduction um, on that three and a half percent reduction again you see an interesting rebalancing of trade between European countries so Franco-German trade will drop by about 23 percent you see an awful lot less trade amongst Europeans and an awful lot more trade with Americans um, if this 3.5% is reduced to zero. So there's a massive rebalancing between EU member states and these traditional trading arrangements within the single market become, you know, they, they, they certainly redu are reduced somewhat uh, significantly. Now, if we have deeper trade liberalization, where we talk about looking at issues of um, um, food and manufacturing and um, where we want to... Uh, um, get the Americans to accept uh, European apples or we want the European the Americans to accept most of our European cheese which is already banned at the moment so there's a ban on, on exporting European apples there's a ban on exporting most European cheeses to the United States if all of those serious regulations are dealt with and, and reduced we are then looking at the creation and this is one of the figures that was, was produced this week um, uh, 2.03 2, 2, 2,043,000 jobs be created within the OECD countries that are linked to this um, to this uh, uh, TTIP negotiation. If it's only trade, if, if they only reduce tariffs by three and a half percent, you're looking then at about half a million jobs created and half of those half a million jobs are created in the United States. Uh, of the two million jobs that are projected to be created with TTIP, a million of those are created in America. Uh, 400,000 are created in the United States or in, in Britain. So there is significant um, challenges particularly on the site on the issue of procurement car sales um, uh, European airlines using American routes for flying all of these things need to be dealt with but I think um, where Bob would disagree that there the timing is quite short um, I would say that you know there is opportunities here um, and the, the signs so far have been exceptionally positive um, for the Europeans this is the only show in town the Europeans it's a huge political issue they need to get get closure on this sooner rather than later um, Obama mentioned this in his State of the Union speech he gave priority to it there was a high-level working group in Europe for the last year uh, who which came to uh, quite a number of recommendations and th these have been largely agreed upon and, and as forming the basis for the negotiations next month Michael Froman's appointment I think cannot be underestimated I think it's, it's a major uh, coup it's, a, it's an inspired choice for USTR um, he would not have taken the position if he had not got guarantees, you know, uh, guarantees from, the uh, from Obama about the seriousness within which he's going to approach these negotiations. Um, so I think there's strong indications that there, there will be serious talk between the Europeans and the US over the next number of months. What I, where I would, and I will close this, my comments are the issue of transparency and consultation. One of the reasons that the European Parliament rejected ACTA was because of this whole issue of transparency and the lack of openness. Um, uh, on that agreement um, there's very little reason why there can't be more openness and transparency TTIP has taken or the TPP has taken it to a, an extreme level where no one really knows even though Bob did note that there's 500 companies or 500 economic advisors from 500 companies who have been privy to all this information for TPP so I think if we go down the road of TTIP there needs to be far more openness and transparency uh, and consultation with stakeholders particularly the European Parliament um, and Congress uh, which will make, I think, ratification much easier. And this is where Michael Froman, on the American side, needs to do a lot of um, walking from the White House down Pennsylvania Avenue to Congress to bring them on board as well, because it certainly won't be easy. There are significant implications for third countries. So even though TTIP and, uh, and PPP are, you know, uh, you know, monumental decision or monumental uh, trade deals, there will be knock-on effects. So some of the statistics that have been published this week will show that Canada, China, Mexico... Um, they do lose out in some of these agreements because you know Europe takes over um, uh, a huge chunk of their existing trade with the Americans 
But on the other side, then, Brazil, Kazakhstan, and some of those countries that produce minerals, then they benefit from the need for raw materials within this TTIP arrangement. So I would be cautiously optimistic that we will find an agreement before the European Commission's term of office ends at the end of next year, and certainly before congressional elections at the end of 2014. Um, but again, I think what is crucial in, for the TTIP in particular is the need for transparency, given the political implications that, that it will have for all 28 European countries um, once Croatia joins uh, next month. So I, I will leave it there. Good. Thank you very much, Martha. <laughs> okay, now our third panelist, Bob, if you want to go ahead. Okay. Uh, <coughs> okay, first of all, thank you to the Wilson Center. And I think I come at this from a different perspective. Uh, you know, as you might notice, I'm Filipino, and I used to work in the Philippine government, and I used to be a lawyer. So all the bad qualities that you might <laughs> expect <laughs> from that side of the world. But I think I, I come at this from a point of view that, you know, how does the rest of the world, how does ASEAN look at trade? How does Asia look at trade? Okay, how does Asia look at trade in the context of what has happened in the U.S. over the last five, ten years, Doha, Seattle, and everything? Because it all boils down to that, I think, in, in a matter of oversimplification. But there are three points I'd like to make. The first is this. Stop thinking of ASEAN. ASEAN ranges from Singapore with its 60,000 per capita GDP to Myanmar where, you know, three-fourths of the people don't even have access to electricity. And half of those who have access have access only because of diesel generators. If you think of ASEAN as being able to hack coherently, cohesively, you know, I'm, I'm, then call me an ASEAN skeptic. It is not going to happen. Uh, they can't even decide who owns which part of which small island in a small you know, piece of the sea. Okay? So to think that ASEAN can resolve trade issues with, from a top-down perspective, when you have differing political system, differing economic perspectives is, I think, too optimistic, especially if you want to think about it in our lifetimes, of it happening within our lifetimes. That's the first point, and I'll, I'll go into much more detail on that. The second is th the politics of trade has become much, much more complicated over the past 20 years. You know, w uh, I joined the Philippine government informally in 1995, just after I think the Philippines succeeded to the WTO. Uh, the U.S. had just basically won the Cold War Trade was seen in Southeast Asia as almost like an unmitigated good. You know, you, you have to do it or else you get left behind by the rest of the world. If you go now to Southeast Asia, you know, I was, you know, I was just quoting, uh, I'm quoting the Philippine finance minister. He just said, you know what, uh, T, uh, TPP is, we have to think of ASEAN when we think of joining the TPP. We have to think of, in other words, what Southeast Asia's considerations are. So the idea of trade as something you must get on and bear the cost because otherwise you get left behind, I think that equation has become much, much more complicated over the past two decades. And as one of the, uh, one of the questions came about, you know, is, is TPP overreaching? Is it trying to achieve too much by, by putting in this high quality trade agreement? And uh, you know, the, the perception is anything high quality will come at a cost. And the question is, will politicians, especially in Southeast Asia, be able to bear that cost. You, you've seen what has happened in Turkey, you've seen what's happened in Brazil. The cost of a political miscalculation is much higher right now in the rest of the world than, than many of us think. The third is, you know, I don't want to sound like too down. I think over the long term, mainly because of economics, and this is something I'll explain, mainly because of economics, trade will still be the way that Southeast Asia goes. Whether it accomplishes it through TPP, through RCEP, ABC, D, F, <laughs> it's going to happen, okay? And I'll go into that reason later. So again, going back, so stop thinking of ASEAN. I, I think one of the things is you have to recognize ASEAN is a two plus trillion dollar economy. But if you take a look, it's basically, if you think about immediate linkages to trade, you have Thailand, you have Singapore, which are about roughly one fifth of that, one fourth or one fifth of that. Uh, and then you have Indonesia, which is the largest country, but which is 70% domestic consumption driven. You have the Philippines, which is 70% domestic consumption driven. So there are different incentives within each country. And it's become much more complicated because simply, if you take a look, you have, you know, Mari Pangestu, the former trade minister of Indonesia. She was the one who negotiated and basically introduced the China ASEAN Free Trade Agreement. Uh, she was the trade minister. Her reward was she was made tourism minister. 
Okay, so there are costs to doing that within ASEAN. So, th so I, I think it's one of the things that I often criticize about ASEAN. When Laos, when when uh, when the integration, and I know we have the the, the Vietnamese uh, uh, from the, from the Vietnamese embassy here. ASEAN is a wide range of countries, and therefore negotiating with ASEAN and thinking that it can act coherently is going to be very, very difficult. That's the first point, and I, I don't want to belabor that point because it's quite obvious. The second is this. Uh, the politics of trade has become much, much more complicated, as I said. And what's the reason? The first is this. When, you, when, when WTO was being negotiated in the 1990s, you had leaders like Suharto, Lee Kuan Yew, to some extent Ramos, Mahathir. These were leaders who were not worried, you know, wrongly so, but uh, we could debate how wrong they were. But they were not worried that they had to watch what was happening behind their back. They had control of state apparatus. They had control, basically, of, 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 of their domestic economies. They had natural access to natural re resources that were still doing quite well they could go out on a limb and say, we need to do this. Therefore, they could do things within ASEAN. They could actively participate in APEC. They did not have to worry about domestic politics as much as the leaders have to do today. Uh, if you just take a look, you know, whether you're talking, even China, where they have to pay attention to domestic politics, even countries that we consider, why did Myanmar suddenly break away from a, shall we say, a, a, an enclosed sphere of its own? Because to some extent, it was worried that its economy was becoming much too dependent on China or much too exposed to China. And to some extent, it was worried that at some point, if it could not manage the internal economic stresses, that there would be social revolt in the country. They, saw, they were afraid. They, were, they saw it in 2007 and 2008. So the, the political calculations around trade or around how do I sell an idea around trade to my constituencies has become much, much more difficult for many of these leaders. And it's not going to get easier. The largest economies, I said, in, in Southeast Asia is Indonesia. Yudhiyono will face or not face an election. He's barred from running in 2014. Again, because he's limited to two terms, to two terms in office, sorry. Uh, the next president could be someone ranging from Prabowo Subianto, a former special forces uh, commander who the US refuses to talk to or has refused to talk to because he was blamed for a lot of the atrocities in 1997, as well as East Timor. Or you could have someone like Abu Rizal Bakri who controls the largest coal mine in Indonesia. These are not the kind of personalities that you think will say, you know what, I'm going to take a risk on free trade because they have domestic constituencies that they must take care of. So how do you deal with those kinds of political realities? Uh, even in Singapore, which we consider as probably the most you know, emblematic of free trade in the region, Singapore is tightening restrictions on foreign workers, especially middle-skilled foreign workers. I, I have friends and I talk to them, and I, you know, some of them are like lecturers at the National University of Singapore. They say, what's your contract? They say, we used to have three-year contracts, now we're down to one-year contracts because there is this drive within Singapore to hire more locally. So the sense of a need to protect domestic constituencies is going to be there, and it's going to increase in Southeast Asia. Uh, three minutes. And so the question then is, you know, uh, is this all negative for free, free trade? And, the, uh, and sorry, I'll, I'll go back to one point. And finally, the last point. Uh, and this is the perception from Asia. Tell me if I'm wrong, tell me if I'm right. Uh, in the 1990s, the perception was you had to get on the free trade wagon. Uh, it was the only way to go. The US had just you know, won the Cold War. Free trade was seen as the way to prosperity. The, and, and there were some economic drivers behind this. For example, the Philippines in the 1980s, I think 60% of its exports was agricultural, mainly coconut, rice. By, the, by 1992 or 1993, that was replaced by semiconductors. So there was an incentive to go into you know, selling more stuff to the world, as uh, Ari pointed out. Uh, in Thailand, the Japanese, because of rising costs in Japan, because of the Plaza Accord, were suddenly get gaining more investment in terms of uh, automobile investments, component manufacturing. So the Thais also had an incentive. In Indonesia and in Malaysia, you were seeing the same things. Manufacturing economies were starting to take off. So economies were saying, we have to find a way to do this. Um, and then you had the 1998 financial crisis. You had Seattle, you had Doha, you had all these things. And then the US 
pivot. You know? in, in basketball, if you pivot too much, it's traveling. It's not allowed. Uh, too many pivots. Yeah, there was this pivot towards the, the Middle East. And so Asia said, you know what? Where is the, what, what, what do we sink our teeth into next? You know, is it trade? The U.S. is not here anyway. You know, you, you'll, you'll disagree with me, say the U.S. Uh, my, my former boss was Evan Feigenbaum. And we said the U.S. never left. But there was a perception in, the, in, in Southeast Asia. And so the sense of American leadership, even you know, if, if free trade was being questioned in its home country, well, how much more in Southeast Asia? So the final point is, why am I relatively still optimistic? It's because one of the things I mentioned, costs in Southeastern China and Thailand are now rising, rising much more than the rest of the region. I was just in Tokyo talking to Japanese companies, and many of them were saying, you know what, the day when we can make something only in Shanghai, you know, I, I saw that, only in Shanghai or Thailand, it is gone. And the day when we can fully re rely on a production facility in Japan because of Fukushima, because of the earthquake, they, they, it's, 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 been, it's been the idea developing that they must diversify away. You saw, you saw the Thai flooding that happened in 2011, which caused Seagate's hard drive prices to go from like 30 for a 500 megabyte, there are $50 from a 500 megabyte drive to $150 in the space of three months. So right now, if you go to Southeast Asia within the next two to three years, you will see maybe components being made in Cambodia, shipped to Hanoi or shipped to Saigon, then shipped to Bangkok before shipment to China, to China before shipment to the rest of the world. The, the production chains in Southeast Asia are evolving and they are changing because costs are rising for a variety of reasons we can, we can discuss, but it is changing. And I think this is the theory that we, we must have, that eventually they will recognize that they must therefore make these relationships which are economic much more seamless. But probably what will happen is, a, as it has happened in Southeast Asia, many of the relationships will be developed from the ground up. That because they see the economic logic, they will say then the political <coughs> logic will follow. So Good. I'll oh. end at that. Thank you very much, <laughs> Well, I didn't, I didn't do a great job of keeping us on time, but we have some time for I questions. I thought it was terrific. Bill, I wonder if we could take some questions from the audience while we gather the questions from the overflow. Sure, yeah. Yes, right over there. Right over here for the uh, mic. Thank you. Arturo Sarucan, Global Solutions. Um, a question for, for Michael. There's, there's not much point um, to bemoan uh, the fact that both Europeans and uh, our American friends have forged forward with the TTIP without including Mexico and Canada. The question is now, once the deal has been achieved, how do you harmonize TTIP with Mexico's free trade agreement with the European Union and Canada's soon-to-be agreement with the uh, European Union, especially in two sectors, automotive and aerospace, where the triangulation of integrated supply and production chains is so important. Yeah, I don't know whether the Europeans have thought that far ahead yet. Um, I mean, th there was uh, a European minister in town last week here in Washington, and one of the questions was about you know Turkey and, and Turkey's relationship with this agreement. And her attitude was, well, they're not part of the European Union. This is a, a US-EU deal. And I don't know whether, th I, I, I think the focus at the moment, I'm sure there is, you know, there are some people perhaps in the commission who are looking at ways in which to uh, create these linkages, but at the moment I think because the, there is such complexity around what the final outcome will be and we don't know how deep or how, uh, how broad this TTIP is going to be. I mean, we're, we're still looking at, uh, uh, there are still a number of disagreements. I mean, we can assume tariffs will be reduced to zero, but then when we look at other things like uh, procurement or we look at uh, intellectual property or we look at financial regulation, I mean, you, you really will, the devil is in the detail. I, I don't know how far uh, the European Commission or the negotiating mandate will be to try and uh, bring these other agreements in, particularly with Canada and the EU. I think there is, they will play it by ear and they will see where this is going, but I don't know if, I don't think it's, this is going to be a, uh, of course it's going to be a, an issue when they're negotiating, there's, there's no crossover, there's th that they try and complement one another, but I don't know uh, how far they will integrate these or whether these living agreements would be reopened or re renegotiated after TTIP has been finalize and then they will re go back as most of these, these deals seem to be living agreements that we will, you know, step by step and a sectoral approach to, um, to trade. But I, I suspect it is important, but I think they'll, 
Uh, we will know more, I guess, as the negotiations open and as more documents of the negotiators are leaked to the media, and then we will have a greater idea as to what's going on. But uh, Next question right there. In the middle. Thank you very much. Uh, this is addressed to uh, Professor Van Usch and others. Please uh, yes, I'm Mindy Reiser. I'm a sociologist. I've worked in Asia on education and workforce development. And my question is about labor standards. You mentioned the challenge, possibly, of a race to the bottom. And you know that the AFL-CIO has concerns about uh, TTIP um, and TPP. Um, I'm wondering what you think can be an equitable resolution of some of the concerns around labor standards. Does the somewhat maligned ILO have any role to play in these international agreements? Do people even think of it as a potential help on these matters? Um, so as, a, as an economist, uh, um, I've so th these are things that, that, uh, that I've not um, I've been looking at it too much. So, so there is an issue that there is certainly a lot of concern of the race to the bottom. Uh, the evidence of a race to the bottom is perhaps a little bit um, less strong as, uh, as one, one might think. Um, and, so, um, and so one always has to be careful um, that one takes into account the economic issues and also the political issues in the sense that um, labor standards are uh, very important to, um, to, to, to think about, especially if you look at what happened in India, et cetera. Um, at the same time, uh, you don't want to create situations where you're cutting out um, certain countries because they are not able to uh, increase the labor standards themselves. Uh, so um, so it's certainly important to kind of uh, take these uh, uh, both into account. Um, uh, ILO has been doing a very good, good work in, in trying to document a lot of it. Um, and so, so these, these are certainly um, things that can be used to, to legitimate better uh, why certain political decisions are being made from an economic point of view. Um, but um, I'm, I'm not going to go too, too much further into that because I'm, uh, it's certainly not my, my area of expertise. Anyone else? <coughs> well, I'll just comment. I think in the TTP uh, negotiations, labor is a very important issue for the U.S. And uh, I, I, I'm, you know, I, the uh, AFL-CIO actually <laughs> really supports the TTIP because um, I guess I, I think that a lot of them think that the European standards are actually higher than the U.S. and they'd like to see us harmonize up. But um, I, may, I may be misstating that. But I, that's certainly something the U.S. negotiators are going to be really pressing hard. Yeah. It's I a critical yeah, element. I think, I think for the TPP, it's far more of a consideration than for TTIP, largely because you know, we have very generous welfare systems in Europe, and we have far more of a solid social floor than the United States has. Um, uh, so you know, we have you know, high minimum wages for workers. You know, it's about seven, eight euro in Ireland alone. So uh, I don't think that's a major consideration. This is one of the reasons why business groups here, the Chamber and, all and others, and labor organizations have been surprisingly quite supportive of TTIP, largely because of the, 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 the benefit it will, it will bring to, uh, the jobs benefit that it will bring. Far clearer, I think, than perhaps TPP. Um, but certainly from most of the, the uh, the reports that have been published, you see there's a, there's a massive, uh, or a at least a very significant jobs increase for the Americans if, if this is negotiated, a deep trade deal between the EU and the US. Uh, it's, it's a win-win for American uh, workers. I mean, you're talking about 1% uh, reduction in unemployment, you know, over a long period with a million jobs created in America. So you can see why the business or labor organization should embrace this on this side of the Atlantic. Um, we've got a, a number of questions from the overflow room, and um, I think we're getting close to being out of time. So do I have time for one or two of them? Or one or two, absolutely. Do we one or two? Okay, so I think the, um, the, f the first one's for you, Bob, and that's the question of could you speak uh, to the regional comprehensive economic partnership negotiations and how that um, compares and relates to the TPP? The RCP is at such an early stage, I think, earlier than the, you know, it's, it's, it's in more infancy than the TPP. And uh, obviously there is a lot of geopolitics around it. There is a, you know, the question is China, uh, Korea, uh, Southeast Asia. Again, I, I think at the end of the day, it will be a, 
the, the different countries involved in this will recognize that they are making calculations. They are making calculations about the political cost of doing this, the geopolitics around it, because even though we might deny that there is geopolitics around it, they will perceive geopolitics around it. So th it's at an early stage, uh, and it is seen as a way of accessing China or ga gaining another way as a parallel way. Uh, will it eventually supplant TPP or will TPP go ahead? Uh, the perception is both can proceed at the same time and eventually they can be reconciled, but that will be s a, a very long process. Okay, thank you. Um, these next three are all uh, regarding the EU mandate. Um, one is the question about investor state dispute settlement mechanism and uh, it, can it uh, circumvent domestic legal systems and does either the U.S. or the EU see uh, the others as an untrustworthy system? Um, secondly, uh, how will the TTIP address inequality and uh, the disadvantage of EU peripheral countries such as Spain and um, Ireland? And um, last one is uh, what will happen with all the uh, bilateral investment treaties um, between U EU and U.S.? So turn those over. To Michael. Um, yeah, the first question on the uh, investor uh, to state dispute settlement. Um, you know, I think the European Commission is quite keen to ensure that there is uh, improvements in the system that, and that improvements can be made. Um, uh, I think there is a new uh, United Nations rules for transparency in this whole area. Um, mm -hmm. I think the European Union on their negotiating side is trying to increase, uh, to have better rules uh, linked to the system, particularly on government control of arbiters, um, a, a code of conduct and, and things like this. So, um, and, uh, you know, uh, this will be, uh, of course, an important area that they will need to, to, to focus on, particularly when you've got all of this uh, investment. You know, the I think the most important part of the TTIP actually is the I, uh, the investment section. And, and of course, this will, you know, generate a new code of, well, one hopes will strengthen existing rules for, for companies who are trading in, in, in both jurisdictions or in multiple jurisdictions, of course, in the European Union. Um, the second question I have. Uh, well, <coughs> do the uh, bits real quick while I look at the second question. Um, <laughs> the bits my memory is a steel My mind works. <laughs> uh, can you remind me of the third question? Uh, the question is what will happen with the bilateral investment treaties with a TTIP? Yeah. Uh, you know, I'm not. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know how this is gonna this is gonna gel with with the overall agreement, but I suspect there will be some kind of a merging um, between uh, the U.S. and the U and the European Union. I suspect this will form a um, an element of cohesion, but I don't know uh, specifically what you know what framework how this will, will adopt. Yeah. Okay. And then the last one was how would TTIP address the. Uh, Inequalities in competitiveness between the EU core countries and the disadvantaged EU periphery. Yeah, I think I think you know we're not going to harmonise tax systems, so there's going to be a certain element of, co of competition still. I mean, the British will have an advantage, the Irish will have an advantage, given that there is English speak there are English speaking countries. Um, but again, TTIP needs to take consideration. All the trade agreements need to take into consideration developing countries and underdeveloped countries and countries that are suffering. So one size won't fit all. So there needs to be some kind of a, a framework in place. Um, interestingly, for, uh, for TTIP, there, you know, some of the studies have shown that uh, Mediterranean countries do quite well in terms of exports. So they will be, um, you, you will have a realignment of trade um, preferences away from the traditional in Europe and far more with the United States. So you will see, again, I, I gave the example of France and Germany there'll be uh, a, re a significant reduction in Franco-German trade. Uh, a, f a far more German trade will be going to, the, to America than going to France. So you will see a major realignment. And actually, um, you know, so, uh, you know, mm -hmm. not, not every country will benefit, but from, from what I've seen, most countries in the European Union, unemployment will drop, marginally drop. Um, uh, employment will rise, the standards of living should also increase. So there should be you know, if, if this is a very comprehensive deal, it, a rising tide will lift all boats in Europe. Now, marginally, TTIP is not the answer, of course, to the European problem, to the, the wider problems of this age of austerity, but uh, it will also be, your member states will also need to think of more clever ways to harmonize this agreement for their own national benefit. Um, 
uh, and this is why you know uh, it's it's in all of Europe, all, all of these EU countries' benefits to get uh, a co as, co as comprehensive a deal as possible, because you can have European airline carriers using American airline routes. Uh, you have all of these Mediterranean countries who produce cheese, apples, who will benefit. Small and medium-sized companies will benefit significantly if regulations in on this side of the Atlantic are changed uh, and 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 moved in more in line with the European side. So, um, you know. There are massive benefits there for companies to export more to the US if they deal with regulation. And this is a new, a new regulatory framework is required. And this will definitely benefit um, mm -hmm. underdeveloped European countries. Okay. okay, I think we're out of time. I'm so sorry. Um, we're going to turn it over to Kent and the second panel. And I'd very much like to thank the three panelists. I think you all did an <laughs> outstanding job. Thank you very much, Aaron. We have to turn over.